So welcome. Uh, this is um, this is one of the many events we, we organize as part of the Climate Tech Coalition. So maybe uh, uh, I will start by introducing uh, the uh, Climate Tech Coalition and Atlas Capital, and then uh, I will introduce our amazing judges that we have today, uh, as well as uh, as the really cool companies that we've uh, handpicked. So uh, a little bit about this event, right? Uh, so this is a, a monthly Climate Tech Pitch competition uh, we organize. The goal here is really to facilitate connection uh, between investors who have committed capital to invest in uh, bankable founders in climate tech specifically. Uh, and as you know, there is many, uh, many investors uh, that are really generalists investing in fintech whatsoever, crypto, but there's not many who are focused in climate tech. And if, if we know them, we want to actually connect them together. And this is really when we started uh, the Southeast Asia Climate Tech Coalition with my partner Kikai uh, in May. Uh, the goal was really to focus all this energy, all this committed capital uh, in climate tech together and facilitate interaction, investment, discussions, etc. Um, so we have now in our Slack group uh, more than 400 members, uh, nearly 200 investors, uh, family office, corporate venture capitals, venture capitals, and all together uh, there's more than 1.2 billion US dollar of capital, uh, and we just need to put this money to work. Um, a lot of the people uh, in the team, uh, in the Slack group, you know, have mandate to invest. So it's just about, you know, putting them uh, in front of some deals and getting them to walk the talk. And that's what mm -hmm. we're doing today, right? So uh, today you see just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, some some people who are joining, you know, they're they are, uh, they are here and thank you for joining. But the real iceberg is, is the Slack group. And that's why we are going to push you guys and encourage you to really engage on the Slack group. Uh, I'm going to give some phone calls to some of the investors who are in the Slack room and say, hey, look, we got 10 startups this month. Go check them out uh, and walk the talk, right? So this is about the, the Climate Tech Coalition. Uh, we run this event every month. Uh, so for those who applied and didn't have the chance to be selected uh, for this time, you know, you might have a chance to be selected for September, October, November, etc. Uh, and this is an online event, so we really have investors joining from all around the world, as well as founders. But all of them are interested to uh, expand in Southeast Asia, and that's where uh, you know most of the corporate uh, partners we have are. Uh, we also organize uh, monthly dinners uh, across several locations uh, in secret uh, places. Uh, it's invite only, and mainly it's uh, eight, nine investors and two startups per event. Uh, and we're going to continue doing this. We have the next event in New York uh, in September for Climate Tech Week, where we'll be gathering nearly 100 investors uh, and 10 startups uh, in uh, Manhattan. Uh, so stay tuned for this one as well. If you know any of you guys um, are, are in the US, feel free to join. The event will be shared on the coalition. So for Atlas Capital, uh, we're a very small uh, fund, but I think we're one of the first uh, fund to be focused on climate technology. We have been investing in climate tech companies uh, since 2020, and we've uh, we've done uh, uh, nine investments under our belt, all in North America and Europe, all with intent to expand in Southeast Asia. And that's what we really believe in. We believe there's incredible technologies that have been developed with incredible IPs in the US and in Europe, but we believe that the impact can be the most uh, really in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so that that's where our mandate is. Now, without further ado, um i'm gonna introduce the judges uh, if you guys are ready for today and then we're gonna get started so uh i think we have daniel tan are you here daniel yep okay you want right to say what yeah. yeah sure um well i say um very good evening to everyone from singapore Juan and the atlas capital team super thanks for inviting era vc as a judge um and to everyone in this event today i'm daniel i serve as an investor in era vc ERA as a group, you know, short intro, we have been investing in founders since 2017, 100% climate native. Our core mandate is really essentially to decarbonize the planet. Fast forward 2017 to 2021, we raised a successive new early stage fund out of Singapore. That's where I joined from ground zero. Um, we invest globally. Uh, we follow where innovation takes us, whether it's US or Singapore or even in Asia in general. Um, currently, we have 24 portfolio companies raising follow on capital of at least 1.5 billion. That's a huge number, but I think it's a significant endorsement of two things. 
uh, in terms of personal belief. Um, one, climate tech is resilient. It's mandatory for humanity. Number two, I think we are all fortunate to be here uh, with Juan to really hear some of the best founders today. So thanks once again to setting this up. Um, just to really cap off the fun, um, ERA VC, we are hyper-focused in seed to Series A investments, 500K to a million dollar check sizes. Uh, we do have a back the winner strategy in terms of following on. Last thing I'd say in terms of investment focus is we are starting to narrowly focus on technologies that can decarbonize, starting from the heaviest industries. So steel, mining, concrete, chemicals, what more. Um, that's all I'll share for now. So, uh, you know, I know, I know it's going to be a, a very nice evening. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Um, I think we have Angela here as well from Second News. Yeah, thanks, John. And hey, everyone. Um, Angela from Second News, as John said, I'm wearing two hats here today. One, as someone with a startup operator and sort of growth partnerships background, and two, as Second News, which does a whole lot of work in climate equity and tech, but has a core climate fund out of the U.S. that invests in, in early uh, seed and Series A stage startups. So, I mean, just personally, I, I was in uh, start. I've been working with startups the last seven years or so. I was in an early stage, fast growing ed tech startup. Uh, education tech startup for a while and then started working on growth partnerships uh, to help impact focused uh, startups grow. And so have been working on climate since 2020 or so, both in sort of developing corporate startup partnerships. So getting that B2B go to market for uh, startups, decarbonizing transport, logistics, um, and specifically heavy transport, so maritime and shipping. Um, and that was fascinating. And went from that to venture building and design, helped design a smart agri-tech venture that ended up getting seed uh, funding from Wavemaker, Gen Zero, and Breakthrough Energy Ventures. So that's the Rice Venture now. I was part of the early team that that conceptualized that. And now with Second News, um, I, I work with both startups, but also accelerators and sort of wider ecosystem actors looking to accelerate the transition as a whole, right? Because you need more than capital, you need more than startups to make this happen. There's all sorts of like things hiding in the background, deep system stuff that needs working on. And that's what I do at Second Muse. But like I said, more about the fund, it's focused on North America at the moment, but ticket sizes ranging from 250K to 2 million early stage investments. And our fund specifically is partnered with some later stage funds. That's the reason the whole fund was created. There are a bunch of Canadian and American investors we were talking to who were saying that the, the pipeline still feels thin or some of the pipeline that we're seeing feels immature. And we wish there was someone who could work with them at an earlier stage, you know, when they're ready to absorb that smaller ticket size of capital, which is why um, we play in that space. So happy to be here um, and happy to, you know, use whichever hat is most useful for you guys tonight. Wonderful, Angela. Looking forward to uh, to catch up, actually, and, and get to exchange more together as well. Uh, and I think we have uh, Janina as well from Brink. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Janina, the Climate Tech Program Manager at Brink, which is a global venture accelerator headquartered in Hong Kong. Uh, also come with uh, prior operating experience working at startups, uh, material science background. Um, and Brink is focused on accelerating transition to a more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive future. Um, we run a bunch of different accelerator programs. Uh, most under climate tech, kind of the two biggest focus areas we cover is uh, food and ag and also carbon removal. Um, we've got about 60 or so portfolio companies covering both of those sectors. Um, we do look at companies globally. Um, typically pre-seed or seed stage when they're running through the program, but i um, happy to kind of support later stage startups as well um, by connecting them into our ecosystem. Uh, generally, our programs are three months long. Uh, we tend to use that as time to offer really tailored hands-on support to the companies, connect them to a global network, uh, and then do everything that we can to help accelerate their commercialization process uh, and make sure they're ready to talk to institutional investors. So. Happy to be with you all here and uh, help however I can. Thank you so much, Jaina, for joining. So um, there's a lot more than this. You know, there's really incredible people that I can see uh, in the call right now. And it's not because that they're not judges, they're not super interesting as well. So, uh, you know, thank you uh, so much for joining everyone. I see that is still remaining quiet. Um, and this is where the Slack can come in, right? Really. Uh, we've got gold in that Slack group, uh, so go check it out uh, for the investors who are in the call right now. You know, 
look at in the fundraising uh, channel, there is, there's a lot going on and there will be even more as we're gonna run that event every month. Without further ado, um, we're gonna get started uh, with the, with the, the pitches. Um, so so um, there's no preferences, uh, disclaimer, right? There's no preferences uh, among the startups. We, we really had them um, randomly, um, you know, there's no sequences. Uh, there is some of the companies pitching here that I already invested in personally, uh, or that my own have invested in, but I won't tell you which one. Um, and there is some that I am personally also interested to invest with my phone, and you know we might we, we might look at them a little bit uh, further after this. But 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 again, this is secret. Uh, there's no preferences. Everybody is put on the same uh, on the same board here. So without further ado, uh, I think we're gonna start with the uh, 3DK Tech. Are you sure. ready? Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So we will have Shopper doing the timer. Um, and uh, whenever you're ready, uh, you have uh, you, you can start. You have 10 minutes. Uh, we, what we do is five minute pitch and then uh, five minutes if there is any Q&A's. All right? Uh, sure. I can um, share my screen, right? Yep. Sweet. Uh, All right. Yeah. All right. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh, yep. Sweet. I think this is good. We can see it. All right. There you go. All right. So hi, guys. Um, I'm Alex. I'm the co-founder of 3DK Tech, and we're decentralizing manufacturing. Let me tell you why. So metal 3D printing, it can, it can do a lot of good um, in, in the world and in the manufacturing sector. But there is a massive issue right now, and that is the durability or fatigue life of 3D printed parts. It's nowhere near that of conventional manufacturing. And this is exactly where we come in. Um, because if the parts are not durable, they're not going to replace conventional manufacturing. Now, this is where we come in and our technology uh, increases the durability and the fatigue life of uh, printed parts by a factor of 200 bring them up to uh, comparable to conventional manufacturing and because we can make it uh, as good uh, we can make the parts as good as conventional manufactured then we have some other benefits that means we can reduce manufacturing times by up to uh, 10 times we can reduce manufacturing costs by up to 10 times when compared with you know conventional manufacturing uh, we've pat patented this technology and we uh, developed it in, in Hong Kong, where, where we were based out of. And to give you an idea of just how massive the, the, the improvement can be, if you manufacture, say, a uh, compressor blade, something in the aviation space, it would take, uh, with other metal 3D printing technologies, 1,200 hours uh, and up to 56,000 US dollars to manufacture a compressor blade. With our technology, it would take 300 hours and about 6,000 US dollars. That's simply because there's no need for more heat treatment and the physical quality and the durability are much higher. The reason why metal 3D printing is so important for climate take is because, well, when it comes to material and energy, um, we can reduce those uh, the use of material and energy by a factor of 20 times. But also, we reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emitted, gases emitted into the atmosphere by another factor of 20. And I don't know if you know this, but greenhouse gases uh, account for uh, Greenhouse gases from the manufacturing sector account for about 10 gigatons of uh, CO2 every year. Now, the way that we're, um, our business model is basically Uber for manufacturing. We have, even right now, we have about 15 companies globally, uh, companies globally that want to use our metal 3D printing technology. And what we'll be doing is we'll be selling our um, li licensing our 3d printers to family SMEs and other tier three automotive uh, manufacturers suppliers that are seeing a decrease in their uh, 
um, basically in, in the contracts that they're making because of the transition to EVs. This is a large swath of auto of, of manufacturers that can now be used for other industries such as aerospace, autom automotive, energy uh, production. These are all man um, these are all basically uh, the uses of our decentralization. These are all like the different nodes that uh, that we can decentralize to. They'll be paying us seventeen thousand US dollar per month and the global companies that need to integ integrate metal 3d printing into their workflow about 10 to 20 percent fee per contract and we're providing our expertise and design for additive manufacturing as well as the printing capabilities of our um of our smes that have our printers the market itself is is massive so uh we've been working with uh, a few companies one of which is uh heiko which is an aircraft maintenance and repair operations uh the market 10-year consolidated market value size is 130 billion us dollars by uh, 2030 and with with our technology we can s speed up their lead time and uh provide better quality um with um in in in, in different sectors to give you an idea, uh, what you see in the corner right now is a uh, compressor blade assembly. That's just one assembly. There's 20 of these assemblies per plane. Now, for each assembly, we can save uh, the aviation industry 48,000 US dollars. And according to Airbus, there's going to be 40,000 aircraft built by 2041. That means a savings of 38 billion us dollars from now to 2041 just for this one assembly okay um, hello Tom. thumbs up done? okay <laughs> yeah i think you can you can rub it up yeah um basically we have the experience to do it i have 10 years experience in metal 3d printing my co-founder 15 years experience in aerospace we have advisors from the aerospace uh, growth of eu in the eu and the us uh, we're raising 400,000 angel uh, by the end of the year and a seed next year. And we've won a uh, gold medal from the World Intellectual Property Organization, top 15 at the Free Electron and top 40 at the Entrepreneurship World Cup. Thanks. Congratulations. It's, it's indeed a, a very interesting one. Uh, we, all f we often talk about, you know, biofuels for the aviation sector, etc. Uh, but and, and similarly, we talk about, you know, energy production, but really, it's it's the building and manufacturing that is emitting the most CO2, right? So decarbonizing that, as well as steel and other heavy industries is, is, a, is a big part. Um, yeah. Judges, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I love sort of decentralized um, manufacturing uh, plays or anything that improves asset utilization and energy and all that stuff. I mean, obviously, some of the first questions that come to mind, lab tested to validate the claims, you know, do you have a stamp of approval from the likes of Tutsur or DMV or somebody? Um, I'm also wondering about, you know, the conditions and durations in which this has been tested or, or is that part of the future roadmap? Because sometimes with these things, you're really limited by the quality of your inputs and where you can get your inputs as well as then there's only specific applications. But like, for instance, I mean, I know someone who operates um, like lots of offices and ports and terminals, 2000 ports around the world that mm -hmm. would kill for this type of thing in their spare parts because like shipping and managing inventory and the logistics behind all the spare parts. <laughs> Totally different sector, right? Maritime, but applicable there too. Um, yeah. The aviation is great to start with. So, how are you, you know, validating that constraints around inputs and and uh, applications? And then, third question for me is, you know, what's the core tech or process that makes this happen, and what stops the other companies from le replicating that tech, right? So, a little bit around the mode. Okay. Uh... That's uh, actually all three questions. I can I think I can answer them in in one in 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 one go because uh, they're all related. So we developed this technology uh, to okay. What differentiates us is basically uh, most of our metal three D printing competition focuses on improving the productivity, and we focused on improving the quality. So we completely de um, uh, re 
engineered the metal 3D printing process, and we used ultrasonic vibrations to seed individual crystals. My PhD is in metallurgy, material science, and metal 3D printing. So um, we tested the hypothesis using uh, ultrasonic vibrations, and the things that we were predicting will happen happened. Uh, this this was in in lab prototypes. We've published academic data. I, I even have um, actually some something to show in this slide. Um, bum, 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 bum. I think in, that's can go into follow ups as well, right? So that's why yeah. use the Slack group, Angela. Please continue the conversation on Slack. Um, and uh, oh yeah, so just real quick, basically the uh, we're also using the um, automotive tier three manufacturers to validate their testing because they already have the testing facilities, and we don't have that expertise. So what we're doing is we're giving them the tools to do the testing and, and everything, and uh, basically intermediating everything. All right. Um, I'm not so. sure. Do we have time for another question or not? So sorry, I didn't mean to hog the questions, dudes. I'll no, let no, you I, think, I think it's going to be one question per startup anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I think that's good. We can move to another one, and we can right. continue like the following following question in the collation on the Slack group. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. A uh, really interesting project. You know, wish you guys the best, and, and looking forward to meet you in person and and do more together. Thank All you, right. guys. Next. Next, uh, we have uh, MK Farm. This one is an odd one. Um, it's it's actually uh, one of the first vertical farm uh, for protein that I've seen and visited myself. Um, Max, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Um, okay, I will present. I will share my screen first. Yep. All right. So once Max is ready, uh, we will go for five minute presentation and then five minute Q and A as well. Can everyone see my? Yep. Okay. 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 Hi, my name is Natapong. I'm Max, or you can call me Max. I'm doing the sustainable aquaculture. I'm the CEO and co founder of MK Aquatech. We are the world's first sustainable vertical seafood farm. So, our mission is to produce consistent quality seafood while minimizing the lily ants on natural resources or the ocean. This is our team. Our team is come from the wireless field, and our expert is the director of aquaculture biotech, who is the expert in last recirculate uh, aquaculture system and water treatment. And the second expert is Dr. Sidinath, who is the expert in crustacean species. And we are also co research with NSTDA and ITAP. So, what are we doing? We are producing the crab, the mud crab, or the crab that called Ciela palamamosian crab, which may someone may call it as a mud crab. Why? Why are we doing this? One, uh, there is a gap between demand and supply. The demand is high. This crab is well known and widely consumed across Asia, but its supply is very low, which you will see in the next slide. And there is that there, there, it has high opportunity in for the business because no one care about this no one doing about crap okay and of course it has to be delicious and the nutritious one without this one there is no point to farming the seafood okay the cap status the supply seafood supply is come from two sources one is from white cod and one is from aquaculture crap is the least white cod seafood and crab is the least farming species and also has the least density per, for farming. You can see from here the smallest for everything. For the fish and another part of them, normally seafood supply, 50% come from white cod and 50% come from aquaculture. But crab has only 5% come from aquaculture, which means there is a big gap. But you can see here, fish is only 4% from aquaculture because the aquaculture fish, fish in Thailand is only bass and cooper. That's the point. But for the white cost, there are tons of fish that mackerel or whatever that we don't do aquaculture. That's the main reason. But shrimp, shell, squid, we, don't, we cannot farm it. 
you can see it's almost 50 50 percent so how can we increase the supply of the craft there are two choices right we have to do more white court or aquaculture unfortunately the crab is the smallest seafood as i just mentioned to you and it's like this since 1998 until now the little the little orange bar that's the crab it's never been changed it the it's smallest forever that's why we cannot increase the supply for white cod. Okay, then there are another choice. We have to do aquaculture. But the traditional crab farm farming has many challenges. It has the main reason why crab is has low density that I just mentioned to you is just 0 0.5 kilo per cube cube. Because crab they eat each other. And, the, uh, and another challenge as well that come from the climate change or disaster. That's why seasonal, the learning stuff, that why it's unstable and cannot, un it, it unscalable. That's why we come up with our farm. Our farm is first modern calf farm in the world. No one never do this before, for sure. It's self R and D and we based on commercial light and affordable model. Our farm is first vertical aquaculture. We put crab to individual box so they cannot eat each other. Okay, we can save and since we can do as a box, that's why we do it vertically. It saves pet 95% and increase production 14 times. And our farm is non-ocean lily and we use sea low resources from the ocean we produce our own sea water that allows us to establish the farm in any location that not that is a non-coastal area we can put our farm in the eastern of thailand northeast of thailand northern of thailand that has no or lao cambodia that has no ocean access which is can make more more crap more or seafood, more holy corn, job distribution, and reduce the transportation from the coastal area to to the consumer. Hello, oh. thumbs up. Okay, it's okay. That's it. Okay, it's just easy. I put the I, I to lap is everything. I recycle the water. I put the crab to the box to increase its production. And I don't use any ocean resource at all. Maybe that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yes. So we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, alternative proteins, uh, fake meat, all of this stuff. Um, but sometimes if you really look at the details of alternative protein, the actual CO2 uh, cost of, you know, those is extremely high. So there's no alternative protein to that that is uh, carbon negative. Um, and as we are rethinking, food cycles closer to city, we're not going to stop eating proteins, right? So it's either beef, pork, or seafood. So this is an interesting one. Um, questions? Sure. Hey, Max, uh, a couple of questions for me. Um, sure. I wonder if you can share, at least at a high level, a little more on the unit economics of your process. Um, also, just if you could go into a little more detail about what some of the inputs are, especially in terms of energy. And uh, last one, if there's time to hear a little bit more about if you have any IP around this. Okay, for the I, uh, for each question, how can we do so? I that not uh, the one that we need to do the input is the full scale of the farm. The input is, of course, the farm, the building stuff. For the energy, normally we do, uh, we, are, we can make use energy less than the traditional farm. But uh, honestly, I don't calculate it just as a actual number, but we know how many motor that we use, how many electric we use, but not exact number yet. That's so sorry that for the IP, we are on the, on the process of doing the IP, which we cooperate with the, our uh, the collaboration from the NSTDA, which they have the IP service as, as well. Now we don't do it yet, but we are under the process. That's what I have to answer to you. Is this clear enough? I'm not so sure. 
I think the last part was on energy. So how sure. does that look? And unit economics. I wanted to ask that as well. So uh, unit economics. Oh, what does it mean? Sorry. So Can one, you explain one it crab, more? how much do you sell it? What's the cost of production? Okay. One crab. Its cost is 50%. EBITDA at 50%. Okay. Feed is, feed is 30%. Of the cost uh, of, of the crab selling price, so 50 50 50 if the cost 50 is is the the profit. Yes, mm -hmm. all right, cool. Again, for more details, question maybe uh, feel free to uh, write on the max post on fundraising. I think he posted about his company. Feel free to write down some questions, I'm sure he will be replying. And I think some other investors uh, will be able to see it. That's that would be a, a good one. Thank you Thank so you. much, Max. And Thank uh, you keep so it much for having you. Stop shelling. Okay. All right. Great. So next, uh, we have Polymetal. Hello. Awesome. Here we All go, right. guys. Great. So just like I'll open up my presentation. How are you guys feeling? Oh, is, is, is the rhythm okay? Are we going too fast, too slow? Janina, Angela, Daniel, what do you guys think? It's good, man. I think you're keeping okay. our attention laser focused. Yeah, we, we don't want to we don't want to sleep here neither, right? Uh, so so yeah. That's a good one. But but guy gonna wake us up because he's doing something really, really interesting. I hope Great. you're ready. Thanks, pal. Um so um Hi everyone, I'm Gavon. I'm from uh, Polymental. I'll explain a little bit about what we do and uh, uh, how we uh, contribute to the climate. Um, so uh, Polymental is a company that combines the best of uh, the two worlds of the polymers and metals together. And we do that through a specific process that we developed um, and uh, for various applications and industries that you can see. So uh, a bit of uh, information about the company. We're headquartered in Haifa, Israel. We were founded already in 2013. Uh, we're about 40 employees today. Uh, we are already selling a few million dollar revenues per year. And we've also achieved an Horizon 2020 grant for $2 million for the development of titanium plating over polymers. Uh, we're right now uh, growing our sales and uh, really uh, trying to uh, be a bigger company. Uh, we have future sites coming up, uh, one in Israel, a bigger one with more capacity and automation to be able to provide to our customers as well as in 2025 to the EU. Uh, we've not selected the location yet, but it will be in the Central European area, mainly to support our customers from the EU. Um, a little bit about our challenge. So uh, we see today that a lot of what the uh, industry is demanding is to have lightweight solution with a lot of uh, metallic properties. So they have to be strong products, but also electrically conductive, but not as a full metal. And also, of course, sustainability to have uh, recyclable uh, materials, low energy production process, and eventually um, at a very low price. And uh, we see that there are a lot of different contradictory requirements that need to be met by this industry. And that's how we came up with our solution, which is combining the two uh, materials together. So the polymers and metals uh, together. So from the polymers, we take the features such as low weight and vibration and drop damping. Um, and from the metal, we take mainly the me uh, metallic properties such as electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, uh, which make it a metallic part uh, with the essence of the metallic features. And uh, we see that uh, there are a lot of different uh, uh, demands coming from the industry and we see how uh, our products are actually meeting these demands. And I'll show you exactly what we use these for. But before that, a little bit about what comes up of our process. So eventually when we compare ourselves to metal, uh, because we're in the metal replacement market, we're actually reducing weight by about 50 to 60% um, per uh, part, that either for lightweight metals such as aluminum, and uh, we also have the metallic features. So as I indicated, mechanical, thermal, electrical conductivity. We have a lot of EMI, RFI shielding applications. And uh, in, uh, additionally, uh, sustainability, we have carbon-free and bio-based materials that are being used as substrates. And uh, just to give you a hint, um, so our technology is actually um, uh, technology that we apply a metal uh, coating on top of the uh, polymer substrate. So the polymer um, is the first layer, and then we do uh, chemical surface etching technology that enables us to have the next, um, let's say, uh, metallic layers. Sorry, I just close the door. 
Um, so we have the copper layer, and then uh, we also have a nickel, silver, tin, or gold uh, layer, which enable us to have uh, a very strong adhesion between the polymer and the metal. And our essence is in the uh, surface preparation process, which is optimized to almost any type of polymer. Um, and uh, this is something that does not exist today in other alternatives. And the adhesion that we create between the polymer and metal is unprecedented and really a state of the art that allows us to be used in actual functional applications such as in automotive, in aerospace, and also in semiconductors. Uh, you can see some of our customers today. Uh, I put down mainly the ones in Europe um, here. Uh, so we have Scheffler and Continental who are tier ones in the automotive. We have ASML, which is a company in the semiconductors industry. Uh, we also have Palestine in the space and Porsche in automotive. I can see some of the applications as well here. Um, we do anything from oil tanks to EMI shielding solutions, which are our number one uh, product, as well as wave guides and uh, 5G antennas. A little bit about the impact itself. So we're committed to decarbonizing. This is the main agenda that we bring. Uh, we're able to decarbonize the carbon footprint by about uh, 50 to 60 percent, depending on the plating thickness that we apply. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we're also significantly reducing weight. Um, so that's an operation. Uh, everything was measured by a third party. We've done a product carbon footprint analysis, and this is these are the results. Um, there's also an end of life uh, opportunity, which means that we take uh, metallized parts and it's uh, possible to separate them uh, through a machine that was uh, done for recycling that's already in place. Um, we have a team of uh, management and also, uh, of course, employees coming from uh, big companies with the sole purpose of growing the company big. Uh, we have a lot of know-how in chemical engineering, um, as well as in products development, um, and also how to uh, utilize and reach these uh, areas. The market... Time's up. Sorry? Time's up. Okay, right. so I think you can write it. You, I mean, let's give you a few... Uh, more seconds to wrap it yeah, up. I'm just finishing up. This is one before the last slide. So we have, we're in a huge market of metal alternatives, uh, which is a $160 billion market, where today a serial manufacturer already in the technology readiness level of eight or nine, and we expect to grow within the next three years, the revenue to about $20 million a year. Um, we're right now raising about, uh, about $4 million. We've already raised up until now 5.5. .5 and we're uh, looking for strategic investments and also collaborations with strategic companies within the fields that we're uh, focusing on. So automotive, aerospace, communication, semiconductors, and uh, looking to increase our uh, sales and marketing activities um, and also our capacity. So with manufacturing uh, capabilities. So sorry for taking a bit more seconds, but I'm pretty much done now. That's no, good. Very interesting what space indeed. Um, questions? Super interesting, uh, Guy Varon. Uh, thanks for, for presenting this. I, I thought, um, interestingly, it's 20 million in revenue. Did I hear that correctly? 20 million and you're, you're raising a 5 million round right now. Yeah, this is we're, um, we're looking to scale up our sales from where we're at now, for which is a few million dollars, uh, to about 20 million dollars within the next three years. And in order to do that, we want we need two things. One is, of course, uh, a bigger uh, manufacturing uh, facility that is uh, that has higher automation, and so uh, that's a part of the investment. And the other part is, of course, uh, the additional sales and marketing efforts in in Europe and the United States, which are our target markets. Okay, understood. I guess my my key question here is when it comes to the IP covering the process, like, is it a system that skills in enabling the combination of polymers and metals? Or rather, in, in short, how is it, is it for your company to create from one material to another to serve various industries on demand? Yeah. So uh, the key capability that Polymerital actually developed is the surface preparation process on the various different types of polymers. If you ask, uh, if you look around, if you write in Google what is metal plating, you will most likely see ABS material uh, that is metal plated to be an aesthetic part and looks very shiny and very nice, but it's not a, a functional part. We're focusing today on various functional engineering grade polymers that we are actually plating uh, with our technology, a very thin layer that enables us to be a highly functional part that also has the metallic features of conductivity, 
um, which allows us to provide uh, parts for EMI shielding, for example, for automotive powertrain or drivetrain, which is something that you cannot do with traditional uh, industries. The only alternative to that is a fully uh, metal part, which is, of course, weighs more and has a bigger uh, carbon footprint than our solution. Thanks. So add to Daniel's question a little bit. I, I just want to get into the setup cost and process for like new applications, right? Um, you were you were saying earlier that the costs are are much lower because less weight, also less materials, and it's a purely chemical process. But like, you know, is there a very long lead time to set it up, or what does it take? And is there a high hurdle for say a new to unlock a new application? So I think in terms of development, uh, just like we develop any other part, uh, it takes around. Uh, uh, you know, a few months until a part is fully developed and integrated, mainly if we're talking for highly regulated industries as it, such as automotive, which uh, everything has to be tested uh, many, many times and um, until we actually reach, um, let's say, zero production. Other industries such as, for example, semiconductors, we have a very short time to market. Uh, the development time is pretty uh, short because uh, the, the parts are actually easier to achieve um, in terms of design, in terms of functionality, in terms of testing. So all this process only takes a few months and then uh, the part is already fully developed. Uh, we have the engineering team here that's actually re responsible for the design of the product. And we have the R&D team that's in charge of developing new processes of chemical etching on top of uh, different types of polymers. And then eventually uh, these two together bring out a new product uh, to the market or to a customer that has a specific need. So we're actually a build to spec uh, type of uh, supplier yeah. and uh, we're working mainly with tier ones. We, we try not to work directly with the OEMs because they're too big for, for us, mm -hmm. uh, but we're very comfortable working with tier ones uh, that are developing the next generation of the parts for the OEMs. Uh, but mainly all the OEMs already know about our technology, about our material combinations, and then they themselves uh, refer tier ones to us for specific projects, which is a great uh, deal for us. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. Incredible technology, um, really exciting uh, market. So th thank you so much for, for joining. I just want to put a little bit of uh, advertising here. So. Um, for, for us at us, we're a small fund, but we like to participate in bigger deal as well. So what we put together is syndications for SPVs as well. So for any of the investors who are in the call today, if you also maybe not able to put, uh, you know, one million or half a million uh, into a company, uh, we do syndication across different uh, engine investors and our fund and other funds as well to be able to access to Series A and Series B deals. So keep that in mind. And with a, a further ado, thank you so much, Kai, for the presentation. And I will call uh, Gazelle for the next pitch. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. Thank you so much, Operatlas team. Uh, can you hear me well? Yep, we're good. Yes, excellent. Very pleased to meet you all, uh, dear judges, uh, fellow entrepreneurs and investors. Very pleased to be here with you today. I'm going to share my screen with you now. Can you please confirm that you can see my screen? All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, excellent. I'm John Salazar. I'm the founder and CEO of Gazelle Wind Power. And as a technology provider, uh, Gazelle is considered now one of the most promising startups globally, delivering innovative solutions for the floating of the wind industry. In Gazelle, we are obsessed with delivering best-in-class product for the floating foundation and the mooring systems, which account for over 40% of the total cost of a floating offshore wind project. Now, we, we need to act with urgency, and that's why, for us, uh, we are so pleased to be here with you all today. If we want to stay on track with the 1.5 degree, degrees global warming scenario from pre-industrial levels, we need to deliver over 300 gigawatt from float, for floating offshore wind, within the next two decades and a half. And we need to move now uh, from, from a pipeline that is less than 200 megawatts. So it's, it's very important that we move rapidly. This is a total addressable market in excess of 650 billion euros. And these are very conservative figures from DMB. And at Casella, we strongly believe this is going to be multiplied at least 10 times. 
on this slide you can see some of the markets where we have already patented our disruptive technology and where we have already achieved significant traction the, the, the company is now delivering projects in southeast asia uh, in the far east as well uh, in the us western of the us in europe and the uk and uh, this is very important to understand our business model because depending on the wind the current the waves and the tides uh, it is required to do bespoke engineering and the solutions that we are delivering for one part of the world are very different than for another. For instance, for Asia Pacific, we are delivering solutions that resist typhoons, while for the west coast of the US, we need to deploy at over 100, 1,000 meter water depths. So it's a, it's a huge market. Now, to turn all this potential into action or to turn all this ambition into action, there are still several problems to be addressed, being the first one, very high manufacturing cost, because the old legacy designs coming from offshore oil and gas require a significant amount of steel or concrete in order to provide the buoyancy and the stability to keep a wind turbine safely operational. Gazelle is solving these problems by introducing a complete paradigm shift in the industry by separating our the flotability and the stability. Uh, we are able to reduce significantly the weight of steel. Uh, I'm going to show you now this video. Can you please confirm if you can hear the sound of the video? I can't hear no, the sound because you can see the video though. You, you, uh, you, you can or you cannot? No uh, sound. You cannot, no worries. I will do my thing while while the video is running then. Um, I will say that um, I'm going to focus on the product because we are very proud of it and this is the key at this stage. The, the most important thing of our product is, uh, if we look for instance at regions like Southeast Asia, uh, is that we want to become an enabler of local content. And this is critical. For instance, in Asia Pacific, where we will set up operations in 2024, um, it's, it's critical, it's, it is critical that um, we are able to manufacture regionally. We expect that regional supply chains will be created. And uh, if you look, for instance, on the average ports uh, in, in East Pacific, uh, most of the drafts are between uh, seven and eight meters. Standard technologies have drafts uh, between 13 to 15 meters for a 50 megawatt wind turbine charge generator. And uh, that requires uh, significant investment uh, in terms of billions of dollars, euros um, for governments in order to improve those, those infrastructures. Gazelle, as you can see on this video, uh, use flat, play, flat plates. It's the first technology using flat plates because this doesn't come from offshore oil and gas. This comes from, from a shipbuilding approach. And this is disruptive technology. We own our proprietary technology. We are able to reduce the draft using this example, for instance, to 4.5 meters during the installation of the wind turbine at port. And we are able uh, during, during the um, uh, transportation to have a seven meter draft. So that's why uh, we are very rapidly achieving traction um, uh, globally, um, specifically uh, in countries like Taiwan, countries like Japan, and countries like South Korea. This, this could be the, the type of solution they, they require in order to enable mass production for floating wind. Uh, I wanted to give you a feel about the technology, uh, but if we look at what makes us so unique and what is making us achieve traction so rapidly, uh, let's say if a standard technology for a 50 mega wind turbine size generator has uh, 10, between six and 10,000 tons of steel in terms of weight, with Gazelle technology, we reduce the weight to approximately uh, 2,000 tons. It's a very significant uh, weight reduction that, of course, reduces the cost. The mooring lengths are also uh, vertical, so we eliminate catenary chains. We reduce 75% mooring lengths. That has another huge impact in terms of costs uh, and also in terms of emission redu reduction of CO2 emissions. Per gigawatt of wind farm installed, we want to reduce 260 kilotons of equivalent CO2, and this is based on the steel reduction, based on our disruptive technology, and this is based also on the reduction of the mooring system. In a nutshell, Gazelle will become one of the benchmarks for floating offshore wind globally. We want to become the preferred choice for developers globally uh, to use our technology, to couple with our technology. The technology has been tested and proven robust, has been independently verified by third parties such as DMD. These basin tank tests you can see on the screen were performed for Iberdrola, the largest renewable energy uh, company in offshore wind in the world. And the promise that Gazelle resembles has attracted significant leadership to our board um, already. Uh, I, I, I'm the founder of the company. I was the first investor. I exited my previous group of companies. I come from a family of naval engineers, naval architects. I'm not the inventor. I made the inventor when I was seven years old. And he inspired me to become an engineer. I later on uh, became a full-time entrepreneur. But uh, I decided to, to exit uh, the previous group of companies and, and commence Gazelle in December 2020. So we are a two-year-old, six-month-old baby, but that moves very rapidly, moves very quickly. Our chairman is Dr. Kavada. Kavada is the CEO of Mitsubishi Power for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. 
Connie Hedegaard is the former Minister of Energy and Industry from Denmark and the ex-commissioner for Climate Action Change from the European Commission. Mesonero is the head of corporate development and M&A from Iberdrola. He's the former CFO of Siemens Gamesa, one of the largest OMs in the world in wind. And we have other very well-known uh, industrialists and investors as part of our board. We, the company or a group of companies is generating revenue based on maritime and engineering contracts, and we have a profitable subsidiary. And uh, the scalability comes from licensing our technology. When I say licensing, is providing access to our patented technology to global developers and EPCIs, the engineering procurement construction installation companies. But it's also uh, providing them access to bespoke engineering. As I said before, it's very important to do bespoke engineering, depending on the site, providing the drawings for assembly and manufacturing. And uh, we are working with leading OMs. We are working with the largest OMs in the world, all in alignment with sustainability, development goals 13 and 7, for climate action change, and clean affordable energy. So, in a nutshell, this is Gazelle. We are raising uh, 23 million euros, and we have now um, under term seed uh, 25.8. And there is a syndicate uh, of um, European investors. So, as Joan was saying before, we can welcome investors from ticket, uh, tickets from a quarter million euros, half million euros. To now a very large industrial investor, one of the largest energy companies in the world, committed 20 million euros. This is Gasel 10,000 meter view. Thanks so much for your attention. All to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, just so you guys know, we, we got introduced with John by a very, very large energy conglomerate in Asia who is working with them. Um, so definitely a lot of traction and, and you know, uh, this is what we want to show also during those climate tech pitch, pitch competition. We we have companies who are quite large, um, quite you know industry based, but also some other early stage. We we want to give the chance to everybody to uh, mm. to 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 be part of this movement. So thank you, John. Any questions? Well, I have one, and one of my first ones was was why VC when things like project development and, and offshore wind and, and really CapEx heavy stuff, I mean, you can go with the project financing territory pretty quick. Though, I mean, you suggested earlier as well that you're more of a licensing play than say developing it yourself, but I, I'd just love to hear that from your perspective. This is, uh, in this case, uh, this is institutional capital from Portugal, uh, where is what we are doing our most important milestone now. We are delivering a two megawatt project in the coast of Portugal, and these VCs beyond capital are bringing a lot of value to the table. So beyond, with the VC is coming a very large bank in Portugal as well. And uh, this is one of the issues that uh, Climate Tech has today, which in order to get to project financing, there is such a big gap. There's such a big gap uh, between yeah. um, getting a technology fully certified and you require significant, it's, it's very capex intensive initially, then you become a cash cow. But in order to get to project financing, and we are we are we are not there yet at that stage of project financing. Uh, so we are at a stage where we've been. Uh, first of all, uh, we were able to uh, get suppliers finance. Uh, we almost got init initially 12, over over 12 million dollars in supplier finance. That was mm. completely settled. The group of the group of companies has zero debt. That's very important, and we're very proud of of getting to that point now too. Uh, but uh, there is value added in, in bringing these institutional investors in terms of connections, in terms of helping us to grow a company. It is very different the type of uh, senior management that we have now that, than when I started this, that I was, I was, I was alone traveling nine months, uh, ten months a year all over the place. Uh, but now mm -hmm. uh, we are able to stay very focused. And again, our next, our, our big next and most important milestone is to deliver a, a large scale project in Portugal. And then uh, we will get into a growth phase where we aim to develop projects in, in, in Japan, in Southeast Asia. And that's why we want to set up operations next year in 24. We have industrial investors too. We have investors from Hong Kong, a very well-known shipping company from Hong Kong. We have now a family office from Singapore. Um, so um, we, we, are, we are proud of the investors that we have aboard. Um, I'm sorry if I'm answering your, your question, Ang Angela, uh, fully. Thank you. Yeah, no, it makes sense. All right. Um, thank you. So I think we can go to the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. And the next one is uh, Reclimate. Hi. Thank you. Paul. Um, am I am I audible clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Awesome. awesome. So take your time and say your script. Thank you. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yep. OK, awesome. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Purvi, and I'm the co-founder of Free Climate. 
free climate is born out of a mission to empower clean technology projects. These projects find it challenging to sustain and grow their business. But clean tech is a big category. So we started with a niche, EV charging station operator. Meet eBoost, one of our company from one of our clients from Vietnam. They currently have 800 EV chargers and they plan to expand it to 9,500 chargers in the next five years, which is more than 10x growth that they are looking for. But they are unable to meet their target because of the initial high investment and Frankly, they don't have that kind of money to support their own growth. So they're really looking for the financing option. Meanwhile, United Nation has recognized EV charging station category to originate carbon credits from their charging activities. So this opens up a huge opportunity for eBoost to originate and sell carbon credits to generate an additional revenue stream that can give them 5 to 15% of their existing revenue. Now imagine hundreds of e-boost in a $40 billion market looking for this opportunity. Now just to give, give a brief about carbon credit, carbon credit is a tradable that you can buy and sell in a carbon market. So in this case, e-boost is selling its carbon credit to the corporates like AirAsia who, who are doing carbon emissions. Now this money goes back to e-boost that will help them grow their business. But why would AirAsia want to buy it in the first place? Because they have mandated by their international body, IKEA, to purchase carbon credit to reduce their emission. They've also pledged to become net zero by 2050. In fact, earlier this year, in one of the sustainability conferences in Singapore, founder of AirAsia has committed to buy millions of dollars of carbon credit annually. The demand of carbon credit is growing at a massive rate of 32%. And just last year, over 500 million carbon credits were traded that is worth over $3 billion. OK, so now we have seen the motivation behind buying and selling of the carbon credit. But where, how would eBoost get these credits in the first place? That's where the real challenge lies in. <clears throat> Sorry. eBoost, to originate these credits, eBoost has to deal with eight different stakeholders, pay each of them upfront fees, allocate their own resources, do things manually, and even after doing all of this, they will still see their money after two to three years. This restricts eBoost to enter into this market. That's where reclimate comes in. We help eBoost with the end-to-end -end origination of their carbon credit, with no upfront fees using our proprietary AI-powered platform that automates their work, digitize their monitoring, and reduces their cash cycles to months instead of waiting for years. Cherry on top, eBoost will also be added to the Reclimates ASEAN network that will enable eBoost to reduce their issuance costs by over 80%. This allows us to work with the SMEs like eBoost alongside big players. And that's how we really differ from the traditional consultants who dominate this market right now. We have already launched our product and just three simple steps, eBoost is on track to generate additional revenue. We charge 25% commission from the sales of the carbon credit. In just eight months, we have secured multiple exclusive seven-year contract with the companies in Southeast Asia. That gives us an ARR of over $67,000. We have many more projects in pipeline that has a potential to generate an ARR of over $200,000. Really, sky's the limit here. We are on track to launch another finance another financing option, green loans, to our customers by the end of this year. With just our existing customer interest and projections, we have a potential to generate over 13.8 million revenue with just our existing customers. Uh, we are also launching our product to new verticals like biogas early next year. I'm super proud to present the team that is making this a success. Yovin is expert at commercials, he was a fellow to the Minister of Transport in Malaysia and a, an apprentice to the founder of AirAsia. Gino is a sustainability expert and he was the founding team member of the first plastic credit exchange in Philippines. And I have worked extensively in AI with the companies like Goldman Sachs and Intuit and started my journey with an AI research lab. Together, we have a power to shape a more sustainable future. And I would like to invite you all to join this journey with us. Uh, currently, Reclimate is raising $500,000 and 
thank you so much i would i would take any question if you have wow right on time awesome uh a great company backed by antler um you know really interesting space there, there's a lot of my portfolio actually who might need this service um so any questions Hi, Bobby. Just one for me. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about uh, the credit issuance process and then how you might align with uh, some of the standard methodologies. Definitely. That's my, that's my question. So. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so for the for the methodology, we are using the Vera. Vera has a standard methodology for the EV charging station operators. So we will be using that. And to the life cycle of the credit and how do you do actually do the issuance? Uh, there are various steps and multiple stakeholders that involves in the process. So it starts with the with the project detail document, and then you actually uh, do the data gathering and and create a PDD, which is a project design document. And after that, you have to do the validation audit and registration, and then you have to uh, create the monitoring report, and then it goes to the verification audit. And then finally, it goes to the accreditation body, which is VERA, that issues the credit. And once you get the credit, you will actually sell the credits in the in the market. So either through the direct, uh, either there's a direct buyer, or you go through the marketplace or the trading platform. So this is the entire. Uh, life cycle of carbon credit um, does that answer your whole question quick quick add-on to janina's question is around the financing and the timelines right so i mean until vera has issued the credits how are you advancing payments to the you know yeah. the ev charges of the world um and also around like green loans and financing a lot of people are looking at that space but the right. sticky point for them is risk Right. So how are you managing that on your end? Great question. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, so to answer the first question, how are we actually reducing the cash cycle, which is actually what we are offering to our uh, to our customers? So with our digital MRV solution, we have two modules. The first module, it actually calculates the real time emission reduction based on the charging activities happening at a charging station. The second module, which is the AI module, that actually predicts the volume and the price of the credit for a particular company. So that forecasting module has the power to leverage the historical data and the company specific data to actually predict uh, predict the uh, uh, predict the price and the volume. And combining these two modules, create a digital monitoring service that is leveraged by both the buyers and the sellers and make the entire process very transparent. And that's how we are actually pre-selling the credits to our buyers. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how we are reducing the cash cycle. Uh, to your second question, the green financing, you are absolutely right. So we are going, we are launching our green loans. And the way we differ ourselves from the upcoming projects is that first of all, uh, there are a lot of taxonomies. So the, the, the way we see that there are lots and lots of taxonomies right right now that the banks comply with, that the companies comp uh, countries comply with, then you have the region-wise taxonomy. So what we are creating is a, an algorithm, a proprietary algorithm uh, that actually based on a project uh, ba based on a project detail, it actually tells you, what are the recommended product for you and what should be the interest rate for you now for the banks we already have uh, we already have the data of our customers like the ev charging station operator but then there would be more different kind of projects that will also register and we'll be integrating it with them so we have the real time emission reduction data and leveraging that the banks will have the visibility into what exactly is the impact of their financing to a company so that's the so the leveraging the data we have a channel that will give the clarity and the risk assessment better risk assessment for the banks and for the clean technology projects they will get the financing 
Very interesting. Thank you, um, Porvi. I think I think there's uh, two of my portfolio company who would like to speak with you. <laughs> uh, one of them is doing EV battery recycling, and uh, they just signed a deal with a, a conglomerate in Southeast Asia to to expand a factory here. This is a North American company, and, and another one is um, is doing a, a carbon credit using a seaweed. Uh, so anyway, uh, we'll 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 reach out to you there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thank you, judges, for asking the question. Thank you. Bye. All right. Um, hey, Constant. Hey, how hi, are you everyone. doing? Very good. Thank you. All good right. Uh, you. I think if you're OK, you're next. Perfect. Awesome. OK, great. You can see the screen. Great. Yep. Hello, my, my name is Constant Tedder. I'm CEO and founder of Fly Farm. The problems that we're addressing are organic waste and the emissions that it generates. Um, and the lack of a scalable and sustainable solution uh, to, to do that processing. So today, 8% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from food, food waste and food waste decomposition. Most goes to landfill, unfortunately, uh, where it generates methane and CO2. Some goes to composting, which is seen as a good solution, but isn't really. It still generates CO2. Uh, some goes to a, a small amount goes to AD, anaerobic digestion, but that isn't suitable for all types of waste. And in fact, there's another solution which we think is better in some cases and has a lower capex and better outcomes. And that is insect bioconversion by black soldier fly larvae, harnessing the power of these incredible insects who digest the waste to, to, to create sustainable protein, oil, and frass fertilizer. Now, you have to do this at scale with technology and robotics, and that would lead to a sustainable and scalable solution. But the problems that BSFL startups face when they, is when they try to scale. Many get started with a combination of mechanization and human labor, but it's not really an, a scalable operating model. And the second problem they face is a CapEx challenge. They have real two, really two choices. They can look at European solutions, which are very high cost, with very little systems integration, or Chinese, which is low cost, but ten, can be poor quality, and has absolutely no software capabilities and no software integration. That leads to a lot of pain. And there's, so there's a lack of integrated and affordable solutions for black soldier fly companies. Fly Farm has developed circular organic waste solutions, which is a full stack integrated hardware and software solution. We combine our own robotics with off the shelf automation, add control systems to every piece of hardware, which operates on our Fly Farm OS, a layer of sensors to create a fully integrated system for farming black soldier fly at scale that is both affordable and highly operable. And this leads to compelling unit economics for the operator. Fly Farm's business model is to sell and support systems outside of our key markets. And we receive weekly inbound traffic, which is passive with no marketing. So there's clearly a demand there. We build and operate Fly farm systems within key markets, and those two combined leads to a scalable and attractive business for, for, for our company, combining tech sales and facility revenues. So who are we? I'm an, a serial entrepreneur with experience in building and selling businesses. I have a passion for impact. My previous companies was Jagex, which I co-founded and sold to Carlisle. Dawn Energy, a wind farm operator, which we sold to Constantine Energy. The Hive, which I founded in Hong Kong, which I built for nine years and we merged to form the Flexi Group. And now with Fly Farm, I have, I have a fantastic opportunity to grow in business, which is incredibly exciting with an opportunity to scale, but also can make a significant impact in terms of emissions. We have a super passionate team, which combines engineers, hardware, software engineers in Hong Kong. And in Brisbane, where we operate our pilot plant, we have operations, biological research, and sales. So we're currently operating a facility in Brisbane, Australia. It's likely to be where our first commercial facility will be. So what's the ask? Previously, Fly Farm has raised five million in two rounds. We're going to be starting a Series A over this winter, and we're interested to speak to impact investors in advance of that Series A to start conversations. We're seeking really well-aligned long-term investors for our next stage. If you're interested, please contact me. My name is Constant Tedder. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constant. 
um, super exciting to to see this new venture. Constant and I have known each other for almost a decade now, uh, and uh, I've followed him through his exits, and he followed me through my exits. Um, fly, fly, fly farm, and and the, the overall. Uh, uh, BASF market is is very interesting. My my first question for you, uh, Constant, is I understand you 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 are actually building a robotical company, uh, and I I find that very interesting uh, because I've looked through a lot of um, of of companies you know in in the space, um, but it was pretty manual, uh, and even though they were sharing, they wanted to do automation, um, the unit economics uh, just didn't justify that for them. Um, and you know they were looking at um, proteins for animal feeds, for example. But it seems that you guys are actually selling those robotics um, to other farms as well. So my question would be in, in, in two sides. Number one, like what's what's the what's the actual model? Are you selling uh, are you selling the proteins, uh, or are you selling the robotical path to run farms uh, to other other exploitations? Uh, that would be my my, my two question. Yeah, at, at our core, we're we're an agritech company, a tech company. So we really see ourselves as as robotics and software. Um, and what we do is look to utilize that that robotics and software in in farms. Now, we, we at the moment we we operate our own farm in Australia, and and going to be doing further farms in Australia with our waste partners. And some of these are very large uh, agri producers and large producers of of food and and and, uh, and and organic waste. And in this case, we're we're operating, but under some different models. So in some cases, we may build a facility for them and run it, and they may pay for the capex. In other cases, it may be jointly invested. So there is a range of models even within Australia, which is where we're operating. But we've also seen an opportunity to sell systems into markets like Japan, which we would take a long time to get to, uh, Egypt, India, uh, all across the world. There are companies also looking at this challenge of how they scale, how to run a larger facility, which really does need uh, technology embedded, but they also need to do it at reasonable cost in order for the economics to work. So what you're seeing with the European early starters is that they've immediately gone to a very, very large scale, precisely because they have a very high capex infrastructure, which is mostly from European uh, automation providers. So that necessitates that they have scale, which most other companies won't get to and can't get to. So in order to tackle the, the vast majority of these waste opportunities, you need to have automation, but at reasonable cost. And that's really where we, why we've designed a key components of that robotics and automation in order to get control of the capex, capex operation. And that really opens the market to a, to a far larger number of opportunities. Yeah, super interesting. And I, I, one of my friends is the founder of Insect in Europe, which you're familiar, obviously. And he was actually speaking at one of our Atlas uh, Coalition event recently. Uh, so, so yeah, definitely, I can see the gap uh, between the capex you need to start those, uh, you know, highly automated farms and uh, and the actual market demand. So, yeah, yeah. anyone Absolutely. wants to have a question for Constant? I think we're good. Uh, inside the okay. slack if that's possible yep all okay. right all right so that's going to be for slack um we'll Great, be thanks. interested uh thank you to do more together um thank you so much for joining today and um i think next i think we have transit tree is that correct chopper Yes, correct. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, thanks, Ron. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'll quickly share my screen. Just give me a moment. All right. Um, I hope the screen's visible. Yep. Yep. All right. Perfect. So, um, hello, this is Navarun. Uh, I'm CEO of Transitory. So, continuing the whole uh, concept of uh, carbon. Uh, market. We are enabling carbon governance. Now, uh, a quick recap. So since last year, we have about 350,000 of hectares of land under management in four different countries. We are focused on decarbonization of the agricultural space, so focused on nature-based solutions. And in terms of revenue, we have generated about $150,000 by selling carbon credits uh, from biogas projects. In terms of product, uh, we have a blockchain platform which is inbuilt uh, on our proprietary blockchain infrastructure. So this is for transparency 
traceability and auditability of the process. And finally, we have uh, AI models, both for predictive analytics and risk analysis for the projects, uh, and also uh, primarily to automate the entire process of uh, enlisting a carbon project. Now, the core problem that we see uh, in most cases is inefficiency of the carbon governance and uh, basically less reliability on the underlying data. So when we go down to uh, you know the issue that was raised by The Guardian with Vera, uh, this is what it comes down to. And this is why any investment, any impact claims that is associated with these projects is always a concern. So we have a very simple system. Uh, the blockchain platform that we are talking about, that is primarily for data governance. And we manage the auditability and the traceability of the data end-to-end. Uh, -end. So that is from source to trade. And uh, finally, because of the AI element of predictive uh, ability, we are able to also um, you know, activate financial commitments. So financial commitments can be from organizations such as um, you may be aware of uh, PFAN advisory. So PFAN is part of Unido and REAP. Um, you've got Green Climate Fund. So similarly, they're also advising other family offices as well as uh, climate impact funds. And uh, on top of that, if we are to look at the actual software itself, so we are classified as MRV, monitoring, reporting, verification. So we go all the way from collection of data from the agricultural farms, uh, including rice. And uh, basically within this space, um, we also incorporate multiple ways of collecting data. So one way can be uh, in the form of a gas chromatograph when it comes to rice. So we do have uh, our own proprietary technology for gas chromatograph. So we are in the process of filing for an IP for that. Mm. On top of that, we also uh, collaborate with um, other IoT sensors, as well as uh, we do rely on satellite data. So, so far, all the data that we have been relying on is primarily from Sentinel-2 uh, and also Google Earth Engine. But additionally, we are also looking for collaborations with other data providers, such as uh, Catapult, which is doing uh, methane monitoring data. So there is certainly a lot of uh, interesting data being provided from satellite angle. And then in terms of the source to trade, we do the entire end-to-end -end process of uh, registering a project, monitoring, then getting it validated by VVBs, which is validation and verification bodies, and then going all the way to sales of the carbon credits. And as I mentioned, we've already sold carbon credits. So selling can happen through multiple ways. We've done um, over the counter. So this was through a broker in the UK. But uh, we do have connections with uh, some of the largest marketplaces and exchanges, including air carbon exchange and uh, CBL markets. And finally, when it comes to um, you know uh, going for a certification, such as let's say Rainforest Alliance, we can certainly get it done because we have the first party data available in hand. Now, I won't go much into detail into this. We are a stack value going all the way from creating digital twin for an agriculture or agroforestry um, use case, all the way up to man managing the carbon initiatives. And uh, in terms of markets, we are looking at two very specific markets, global voluntary carbon offset, which is about $2 billion right now, um, and then going up to about $50 billion, and obviously global green finance uh, market. So global green finance market is supposed to be uh, close to, uh, I would say, a few trillion dollars, um, as reported by World Bank. And essentially, we're looking at about a $400, $400 billion market by 2030. So certainly, that is where the largest market lies. And uh, the way our business model works, is that we take a success fee on the sales of the carbon credits, which is about 25% uh, to 30%, but it's negotiable. Um, and then on top of that, the SaaS platform that we are providing, uh, the MRV, that goes for about a uh, dollar per hectare per year. And uh, that amounts to about, let's say, 15,000 to all the way up to, let's say, $30,000, depending on the size of the project. So size of the projects we're dealing with are about 50,000 hectares, all the way up to 300,000 hectares. And uh, in terms of the financing, we are uh, about to launch the financing by the end of the year. So that's about 0.5% commission on the financing uh, value. So this is the core business model. And uh, in terms of our traction so far, so as I mentioned, we have reached about 500,000 hectares of land under management. The target by the end of the year is about uh, close to 2.5 to 2.8 million hectares. And uh, the estimation is uh, very simple. It's based on an estimate that we are able to generate average of three to four carbon credits per hectare per year. And uh, the selling price for nature-based solutions is about at $10 per carbon credit, but it is expected to go up to about $50, $60 by the end of the year. Um, just a quick mention here is that there are some outliers. So we are running a biochar project right now, and the biochar project is in, Indi uh, is in uh, Indonesia. 
So biochar has two different types. One is you can apply for uh, carbon credits for the production, and you can apply for carbon credits for the application. So biochar credits, they actually go for about 100 euros per credit, and that was this year. So this is where the outliers are, and obviously we do have those elements coming in and impacting higher revenue as well. In terms of the team, uh, myself, I come from a corporate innovation and venture capital background. So I used to work with plug and play. Um, I have been associated with multiple agricultural sector uh, companies such as uh, Sharon Popcorn Group, Genting Plantations, Sime Dabi Plantations. So we do have actually um, the palm plantation partners in Malaysia as well. And uh, for Vishan, he has been a corporate venture builder and he has been primarily involved in products. Uh, lately, he also uh, built out a carbon accounting tool for one of the largest oil major companies. So um, Vishan handles all the product and the operations. I handle the business development um, primarily for the company. And uh, we do have the have a team of in-house agronomists, as well as uh, we do have a very strong AI team. Uh, plus, we are getting into very strong collaborations with universities in South Korea, as well as in Australia. And this is to focus on two things. One is... Uh, AI for satellite data analysis, so basically GIS. And then the second part is actually crop modeling. So if you look at crop modeling, this is a way to simulate different scenarios of emissions. Um, it can, uh, so just wrapping up, uh, it can be for carbon dioxide, um, methane, nitrous oxide. So we're primarily focused on that and uh, we're trying to improve the models. So that is another IP that we are working on at this moment. So yeah, uh, I think quick wrap up is that uh, we've already raised a uh, pre-seed round of $600,000. Uh, that was late, of, uh, late last year, Q4. And uh, we are looking to raise another million dollars at this point. Um, so, yeah, that's us. Thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. Uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing I want to share with you guys. Uh, I usually don't like blockchain. Um, but no when problem. I saw this company and the quality of the founders and, and you know what they have achieved so far, I found this was pretty legit. Uh, so to me, this is more like a carbon um you know registry company than a blockchain company and, and hence this is why they're here uh, otherwise we lack more deep tech stuff you know in the coalition hardware etc but this is a very interesting one so so yeah so, congratulations on whatever you've done and um you know yeah. daniel if you want to go with the questions thanks, thanks john uh, uh, if, I, if i just may yeah. if i just may there is there is actually ip being created around hardware which is the gas chromatograph so we will have that coming up soon as well yeah um, awesome. Yes, awesome. I'm doing good. Navarun, Navarun, you might have already said this on on the pitch, but I might have missed that out. But how do you make yeah. money? Are you essentially providing um, MRV services across different nature-based solutions, or connecting funders to high-quality project developers, or both? Yeah, so uh, I actually mentioned this in the um, the business model slide. So the yeah. the way we make money is three ways. Um, one is about ten to twenty percent commissions on the carbon credit sales. So which is as part of the uh, the carbon mm. project. But what we realize is that, you know, uh, when we go to a certain corporate farm and we are primarily working with corporate farms and we're also working with FPOs and NGOs to as actually consolidate um, smallholder farmers into uh, a collective. So when we go to these folks, uh, the issue is that they don't understand the carbon market as well as we do. So the first thing is to create a baseline. And the way you create a baseline is to start with data management. So deploying the MRV, the blockchain platform is actually very important. And uh, on that, we do charge a SaaS fee, uh, which is a dollar per hectare per year. Uh, but then that scales down as the size of the farm scales up. So if we are talking about consolidation of, let's say, millet cultivation in India, we are working across seven districts in the state of uh, Karnataka. Uh, and uh, that is about 300,000 hectares of land overall. And these are all smallholder farmers. We cannot be charging them a dollar per hectare per year. But essentially, this is where um, another interesting thing happens is that um, some of the uh impact funds come in which are not looking for profit so for example bill and melinda gates foundation adb ventures nabar uh, these are folks who come in into a uh, picture for this kind of scenario now uh, we do work closely with some of these folks that i mentioned um and the last part, part which is what i was mentioning is and and daniel i've uh, talked to you about this before as well is and yep. we are looking to uh go for the the green uh, financing by the end of this year and again uh, i think there was a question being raised on the risk analysis uh you might be aware that uh, so plug and play has invested in us i used to work with plug and play as well and plug and play has invested in another company called silvera uh, and then there's also b0 so b0 and silvera they do a lot of risk analysis now uh, when you look at them they do the risk analysis based on publicly available information in the uh, project design documents the pdds that you can find on the registry websites but that is not enough you need first party data you need uh, on-ground data 
So this is where we add that element where, I mean, this can be actually while talking about this, this can be one of the exit strategies when you look at, you know, us potentially selling to a sister uh, portfolio company of uh, Silvera and uh, adding to their capabilities. So certainly the fact that, you know, we have sensors on ground, we have the gas chromatographs on ground, we are looking at satellite data, and this allows us to create the risk analysis that enables us to impact both, uh, I would say, the risk element for the financing, as well as there is actually something which is uh, very important here. There are uh, loan products which are out there in the market for um, uh, farmers, but farmers don't know how to access it and they don't know how, how to you know, actually help with the underwriting by diminishing the risk. So, uh, so yeah, these are these are a few things. Um, on the financing piece, we are looking at about 0.5% um, commissions mm -hmm. and uh, also considering that the market is pretty huge. Okay, thank you, awesome. I just have to add that I was smiling so much when you were talking because I know I was you're super, so good advice. I know I, I was super, super skeptical. I can't tell you how many carbon registries and management and whatever you know, like platforms you yes. see right now. Like everyone yeah. is trying to make selling carbon credits easier, but then the bottlenecks are <laughs> producing really good projects, right? Like it really pisses me off yeah. sometimes, actually. And so yeah. I was just like Absolutely. major red flags until you said, well, the grass uh, chromatograph which is important like yeah. it's really really expensive to properly measure methane today if you're just yeah. using eddy flows and just satellites it's not enough so i was like how are you better than all the satellite guys so that's yeah. one and then when you said aggregating small holders that i mean that's also a special yeah. thing for me because the inclusion aspect is so high and a lot of exactly. I mean, the same reason for the same reason that like msmes and smes are such an untapped opportunity in asia because they're majority of the businesses but they're so hard to work with majority yeah. of the land is small holders so if you can yeah, you know, reliably aggregate and measure and engage i mean obviously the doing is different than the saying but i mean <laughs> curious to learn more um yeah and and angela you you mentioned a very good thing um eddy covariance method it's uh it's like it actually has two shortcomings one is the unit price which is close to about Two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollars, and then the other part is actually uh, the the flux, the variance in the flux uh, for the methane emission. So that is actually highly uh, unreliable as well. At the same time, so uh, it does come down to gas chromatographs. But um, there are ways. I mean, if you look at companies like Tyranus, uh, Tyranus is relying on uh, they've been relying on descent model, right? So descent model has been their go-to. Um, some of the other uh, folks rely on the DNDC model for, uh, you know, simulating in, in rice decarbonization, um, both for methane as well as for nitrous oxide. But uh, even with DNDC, there are issues. So we are actually looking to develop almost like a self-serve tool, essentially, um, where you can have a much higher reliability. And we are looking at uh, new modeling methods, actually. So this is happening with multiple collaborators. I, I cannot disclose who the collaborators are, but this is happening with multiple reliable collaborators. And uh, verification for this process is very easy because Vera, they actually go ahead and um, you know they put up details on some of the independent modeling experts they rely on. So we can actually get it cross-checked by the IMEs as well. So that's, that's not a concern. Yeah. Cool. Apologies to the others. I know we took a long time on this one. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but it's um, it's an interesting one. I, I, I mean, I, I share exactly the same feeling as you, right? We we see so many, we reject so many uh, similar companies uh, uh, reaching our, our inbox all the time. But you know, this one I think is is pretty legit. And and just to add on that, this is this is what we're doing. You know, with the coalition, we're trying to screen a little bit the companies. You know, uh, so not everybody is getting accepted. We we actually rejected. Uh, uh, more than 40 companies uh, so you get like you get one chance of a four to be to be to be there and, and that that's kind of the quality we we want to have um so yeah thank you so much navarun uh, i yes, will be we'll continue the conversation on slack with you as well um, yep, absolutely thank you for joining and hope you will get um connected with with some interesting uh, investors from from this absolutely I, thanks um next um I think we have Argento Lab. Hi guys, Anthony here. Um, is it okay if awesome. I do a quick elevator pitch? Because I'm just uh, conscious of of time here. Um, instead of sure. sharing my own, you know, pitch deck and everything. So my name is Anthony Fiorini. I'm based out of Bangkok. Um, moved here about nine months ago from London. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Argento Labs. We're a UK-based biotechnology company focused on research and development. Um, 
And as you guys are aware um, of the problem in, in Asia alone, there's over 44 million tons of agricultural waste being burned in the Asian Pacific region alone, not to mention Africa, which is over 200 million tons. And this is, this is really where we come in. Um, so we can convert any sort of agricultural, forestry um, or municipal or industrial waste into, into valuable um, biotech products. Uh, what we do is we extract the valuable sugars, proteins and fats from that waste. Um, and then the, the, I guess the valuable bioproducts that we can, we can turn that into consist of, of food, um, could be animal fertilizers, um, animal feed, sorry, biofertilizers, biofuels such as cellulosic ethanol. Um, so that's our, our value proposition. Our USP is that we can do this at a fraction of the cost and time compared to traditional met methods, um, all while staying nature-based. Uh, nature based. So we utilize over 180 living organisms um, as, as um, ancillary components to our, our process. Um, and we actually have a US patent um, which protects our pre-treatment process. Um, as well as that, we have a bunch of enzymes in-house, a library of enzymes, um, as well as industry secrets. Um, and I guess our, our, our call at the moment is we've been bootstrapping up until now, so we're open to external funding. We're going to be raising our first seed round of 1.2 million. Um, this will mainly be used to, to have our own research and development facility in the UK. Um, because up until now, we've been relying on third parties, um, universities and, and engineering companies to validate our, our results. Um, in terms of our, our validation, we've, we've um, successfully scaled up to 1,000 litres. So, so now we're looking to go up to 15,000 litres per day. Um, that was a very quick elevator pitch, so happy to answer questions. Um, apologies again for being so um, on and off the Thank call. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's perfect. All right, so Angela, Daniel, um, Jenny, now anyone um, who have a question, feel free to go. Yeah, I have two. Um, one, curious what you're thinking about in terms of actually uh, collecting the waste, or I guess if you could talk a little bit about how big your system is, if you'd be kind of operating on site where you might find uh, the waste aggregated. And then secondly, if you could just talk a little more detail kind of step by step through your process um you mentioned pre-treatment and also curious if there's any kind of purification uh other types of steps after the extraction sure so um in regards to the feed, feed stock and um exit that was you know we're in the teething part so that's one point we were thinking about but but now we have pivoted um so we're mainly going to be focusing on i guess think of us as a software a SaaS platform slash hardware. So think of us as a UK based R&D facility, and that's where we'll be licensing our technology from to industrial partners. So that way we, we don't need to focus on the feedstock um, or any logistics in that regards. Um, so for example, we've signed up a partner in Thailand who's a major rice exporter. Um, naturally, they have excess rice husks, so we'll be converting that into cellulosic ethanol for them. But um, you know, they have everything sorted in terms of the feedstock, in terms of the exit plan. Our involvement is literally just licensing our technology to them um, and, and receiving royalties based on our, our production. Um, in terms of the technicalities, I, I can chat with you offline because it's, it's quite detailed and it's best to have a chat with my CSO, Richard, in regards to that. Not so much a question, but a comment. I really like pluripotent technologies. Like I think that just have so many different applications. Um, this reminds me a little bit of Lanza Tech, right? Um, turn any sort of hydrocarbons into any other useful thing, and you're doing something similar with waste. So interesting. It would be interested to we're see. Actually, we're actually, uh, we found that we're, I don't want to put a figure on it, but we found that we're much more efficient than Lanza Tech. Um, and our CTO, Rebecca, has, has worked with them in the past and and yeah we even though they they have much more resources than us there you know we we're, we're in a better place and looking to to add them as a, add them on as a client as a consulting client actually so um, yeah great 
Uh, I think, thank you, Anthony. I think if you, you want to share more details on Slack fundraising, maybe some other people would be also interested. Feel free to share your deck. This is a safe space. Um, and yeah, looking forward to, to do more together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. All right. And uh, last but not least, um, I think we have uh, Zachary. Are you here, Zachary? I am. Good morning. I, and, and thank you for letting me go last uh, to get this a little more uh, sleep in my morning. I really appreciate it. How is it going from Chicago? Um, everyone is uh, uh, up. <laughs> slowly getting up. <laughs> All right. Cool. Whenever you're ready, Zachary. Wonderful. I'm going to share my screen here. Perfect. Well, um, good morning from Chicago, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I am Zach. I am the co-founder of Seawood Zabin. And today, we're going to look at the future of cities and the future of work. Our cities are facing a very big climate problem. They're the world's largest contributors to climate crisis. And we're producing 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions and consuming 40% of all world's energy. So how do we solve this? What's, what's going to be the answer? Well, cities are looking outside their city walls and into nature, where we can create living, breathing buildings with nature and climate technologies. Here's a really cool thing. It's already happening now. Uh, in more than 60 cities with strict regulation and policy mandates. And not surprising, Singapore is a shining city and leading a lot of these efforts. Uh, with green building certifications, requirements such as LEED, WELL, and BREAM. And it just makes sense for property owners. It's better for the planet. It's great for business. Uh, it increases property values. It improves energy savings. And right now, when the world's talking about back to office and commercial properties, it's enhancing market building, marketability of the buildings. Um, here's work of what we're just doing here at Zobin, um, working with some of the world's largest tech companies and property owners. We're just going to go through a few projects. Um, this is a look at Amazon's latest HQ2 development. This is going to be uh, completed in 2030. Um, but going back to some of those green building certifications, this is going to reach LEED Platinum. So that's the highest green building rating you can achieve for sustainability. Um, this is what's happening in our backyard in Chicago with uh, Google's latest development. This is a very large retrofit. It's being uh, underway here in Chicago. Um, this is one thing I'm, I'm most excited about. It's, it's, it's an active building. Um, so meaning it's sequestering 11 tons of CO2 per year, creating these microenvironments within it. And it's creating 10 tons of fresh oxygen. So not just for the Google employees, but when we think of just the city area, it's, it's a, a breathing center, it's lungs. Um, on the West Coast, uh, there's a really large transformation happening at San Jose to become, again, the world's first LEED certified city. Um, so here we see climate-based technologies such as green roofs and living walls all being part of this development. Okay, all those uh, renderings look super cool. Um, and we have projects too, but how does it work? How does the technology work? So it's it's building material. It's construction material. Um, it's hydroponic. It's 15 times more water efficient than soil-based systems. And from architecture engineering perspective, it's 66% lighter. And soil based systems. And we've integrated sensor technology that optimizes plant health according to moisture, temperature, humidity. So we have 99% plant replacement and survivability. So we've eliminated the need to replace plants, really, to maintenance plants. So it's highly scalable. Um, it's hardware. So how do we get to these uh, ROIs? So we actually integrate with CoveTool data software visualization. So what we do with these large developments, or for retrofits we're seeing with Google, um, is we've integrated data software uh, visualization to run uh, simulations on the existing building. And that's how we create tangible ROIs in the forms of energy savings and carbon offsets. And so when we work with some of these large property owners, what they're asking with Local Law 97 in New York is, how do we do this in our portfolios that there's really aggressive mandates or policy now being written on decarbonizing these assets. So we're doing it across portfolios, which is really exciting. 
Um, then we thought, okay, we're, we're retrofitting these buildings. We have some really cool things. What about just the time, 90% of our lives we're spending in buildings in 10,000 hours uh, of our lives at work? So we, uh, we've we basically shrunken down that, that technology to create a turnkey product. So it's uh, creating um, living walls, uh, uh, the Model Z is what we call it. It's uh, micro environments that just mimic nature to create healthier spaces for people in nature to thrive. Okay, let's take a really quick look at our unit economics here. So you, you kind of see the Z panel, it's the building construction material, um, uh, as I was sharing a little, little earlier in the slides, that since we've replaced the need for uh, really landscaping, we've understand that budgeting that fits in a lot of that. And so we just the software is, is optimizing it. Uh, the Model Z, again, is a turnkey product. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the smart planner here because what we we're finding when we we're doing a lot of this technology where clients were asking, do you just do plants at first? But no, we're free to work. We're future cities. Um, we're doing these microenvironments and thought, actually, this is a huge problem for our buildings uh, for decarbonization because we're sending in technicians, uh, companies to water plants once a week. And that's not great for the, uh, the transportation per building and then per floor. So we've just launched uh, the smart planner as part of that. Um, really quickly here, uh, we have a, a busing pipeline, a lot of times there's all your projects in the future. Um, we have a 17X uh, LTV CAC. Um, we've uh, just about to achieve a 200,000 ARR. Uh, just to give you kind of a trailing revenue there, we did 100,000, uh, less than 100,000 ARR last year, and the year before that, 19,000. And we have a uh, strong SAS uh, margin side to it. And this is our seed round. Uh, we've raised a million. Um, we've done it through Angels. We've done it through uh, Plug and Play, uh, Google Startups. Um, and you're part of the Procore uh, uh, Founder Forum um, and the Pritzker family. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for your time and for listening in. Awesome. Thank you, Zachary. Um, and um, unfortunately, there's my logo here, so no people know which company I invested in. Of course, yes, of course, <laughs> yes, of course. That was, it was without saying, yes. Um, no, I, I was trying to hide it because there's a few others uh, we're pitching today. Anyway, um, thank you. I, any question, guys? Uh, Daniel, Janina, Angela. No, I'm good. I'm good. I've I've seen Zalvin and and we have um, really spoken in the past. All right, cool. I was. Um, um, I have one um, because I mean, it looks like just from the software margins, and it's like I mean, buildings also like to beautify and the aesthetic, and it, it seems like a sort of low hurdle way for them to get involved. But there's a big question in my mind around the the planet impact, just because like I mean, ten tons per building is not gonna. It's not gonna. That's not gigaton potential, right? And and, and yeah. not to not to disparage what you're doing, obviously. So like I'm. I feel like with green building solutions, it's very often in the the water or the energy savings and many other solutions kind of do the same. So you kind of wonder, you know, if, if the solution or the, the thing that you're targeting with buildings is very similar, like, you know, water efficiency, energy efficiency, is there a way that you're doing it better somehow? Like, like this is an easier to adopt solution, easier to understand in some way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th th yeah. Th there's a great, um, you make a really great point. When we talk about the 10 tons of, uh, oxygen that's being actively being captured by by plants, um, and then the, the oxygen being created is just purifying the air within just one building. But when you think of just the uh, the material as building construction, and what it's doing is it's allowing uh, up to twenty five percent of improving energy savings. And we just think about it. So today in Chicago, it's been one hundred and three degrees. Um, you know, the hottest days uh, in recorded history. So what's happening with our cities, particularly when we have these heat waves, is we're creating these heat out uh, effects. So when we add green roofs, one of the reasons why a lot of policy, and again, more than 60 cities are, are uh, mandating up to 20 to 30% of existing rooftops for new or, um, uh, or, or for retrofits to be green is because what it's doing is absorbing a substantial amount of that heat. Uh, as much as 50%, so it's absorbing it. Just think of on a summer day, when if you were to walk on maybe uh, your, well, definitely concrete for sure, and just to put your feet in the grass. And so what it's doing is it's cooling, it's um, it's adding better insulation to those buildings, 
And then for property owners, you're not having to replace them every 15, 20 years. It, um, a lot of technology lasts until 50 years plus, just because the studies have been long. But um, what that's doing from a city level is it's cooling five to eight degrees the entire city. So if we just use Manhattan, for, for instance, and what that's doing to the, the grid is actually has a huge effect. So you're totally right. Um, if, if it's a single building, it's making a difference in that building. But once we start to compound it with regulation on citywide, what Paris is doing with their zinc roofs, now it becomes to make a very, very big effect, not to mention all the benefits to that biodiversity, to those ecosystems. Um, again, Singapore is absolutely leading the way in architecture and, and uh, usually using more than 100% of that area uh, up to 150 uh, um, of uh, adding nature uh, elements to it. So we just need to re readopt, we need to create resilient cities. Um, but the great, great, um, great point there. Cool, no, and thanks for clarifying. Obviously there's more, there's other ways to create impact than just say carbon sequestration. So, I mean, the, I think the, the, the cooling effect on cities wasn't super apparent in the presentation, but thanks for um, clarifying. Um, I know everything already, so no question, just saying, uh, looking forward to be with you in the Climatech Week in New York. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for joining, Zachary. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evenings. All right, good. Um, I think this is, uh, this is all for today. Uh, how do you feel? Janina, Angela, Daniel? Not too long, right? Oh, I was I was scared I was scared that this thing gonna last for like three hours and I, I fall asleep or some somebody fall asleep, um, but I think it's went pretty okay, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, for sure. Some some interesting companies, definitely. I would have loved more interaction with um with the other investors, like you know when, when people can just sitting watching quietly. It would have been yeah, awesome yeah, to see yeah. more questions on the yeah, slide. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at some point, we had uh, we had thirty people. So I know uh, among these thirty, there were there were uh, twelve of them were actually actively investing. They were they were shy, <laughs> but I, I hopefully they they will uh, they will interact uh, on Slack directly. And again, I think I think the goal here is is not to show off, right? There is people with actual money, who, you know, interested, curious to. So so we want to create that platform. Thank you so much, everyone, for. For joining, uh, we we with the, the coalition will have this speech every month. Uh, we'll try to rotate uh, to have six judges uh, every month. Uh, this time we had two judges who cancelled a bit last minute, so unfortunately, uh, it was a small team. But thank you so much for your participation, really, Janina, Angela, Daniel. I, I think you know the, the questions you you asked were were very interesting, and um, and, um, and 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 yeah, uh, hopefully this will be helping some of the companies. Um, the coalition again is not just about investment but also commercial collaborations and i think you know in climate tech specifically i think uh, you were mentioning it uh this is so much uh, about uh, about you know finding those partners having those grants etc so any any tips or any recommendation or introduction you can make uh not specific only for an investor but maybe for a potential partner or client or vendor relationship is welcome for any of these companies um any company that you see is early stage you know seed uh series a that wants to uh you know come to asia connect to investors feel free to recommend them to join for our next pitch uh mm -hmm. it's gonna happen at the end of september uh, in the meantime for the winner um <laughs> Who actually attended so anyone that attended uh, our pitches today uh we're doing an invitation to join us for the climatic week in new york on september 19th uh, and by the way we would love to have you guys as partners for the event whether or not you can join it you know help us spread the word you can share it to your to your pages your social you can recommend some people to join the event as a guest or as a speaker um so i think about you daniel uh, i was talking mm -hmm. with derek this morning he, he might be our speaker for the event actually awesome. uh, so thank for you janina if you have people to recommend angela as well um so yeah uh, thank you so much for joining today everyone uh, looking forward to have uh, a lot more help uh, we need a village to build climate tech companies right it's, it's really it's really the point it's much harder than software so let's let's help each other and uh, let's make this world uh, a better place with green and clean tech technologies. Thank you. Awesome.